I think we're recording now. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so it's 4 a.m. in Toronto. Yes. <laughs> and it's 8 p.m. here in Wellington, New Zealand. And this is One Mindful Breath. Bill, we're very pleased that you could be with us tonight. And um, I'm not going to say anything more than that, but just hand it straight over to you to, to tell us a bit about what you do, why you do it, the kind of results you get, how it feels, and how you feel it relates to our secular dharma. So, Bill, over to you. Can we turn Bill up a little bit? What, sorry? Can we turn the volume on Bill up? Yeah, yes. can we turn the volume on Bill up? That's oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, it's a really interesting adventure to be giving a talk at 4 a.m. Uh, and uh, but to a secular Buddhist group on the other side of the world in Auckland. And uh, I have very fond memories of New Zealand. I lived in Lower Hutt in Wellington for three years when I was a boy. My dad was a Canadian diplomat at the High Commission. And so very fond memories of New Zealand and Kiwis and uh, uh, looking forward one day to uh, to visiting uh, New Zealand again. So, so I'm here to talk about emotion-focused mindfulness therapy, which is uh, an approach to mindfulness um, I've developed uh, to to help people where th when they get stuck around um, inner conflicts, you know, where one part of ourself is beating up another part or suppressing a part of us is suppressing feelings or or if there's unfinished business coming up around early life trauma or current conflicts with people. Um, so I want to describe emotion-focused mindfulness therapy to you a bit, and then, uh, and then uh, compare and contrast it with secular Buddhism because it has uh, secular Buddhist uh, meditation roots. Um, especially when I refer to secular Buddhism, I'm talking about the secular Buddhism of Stephen Batchelor and Winton Higgins and Ramsey Margulis. Uh, so, um, and then, uh, um, and so I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time descri describing emotion-focused mindfulness therapy and all of its complexity, but, uh, but rather uh, focus on a couple of key points uh, that I'd like to share with you um, around how we can view emotions as adaptive, as helpful, and uh, how they can help us navigate our life. And, uh, um, and then I'd like to, uh, to ground that in, uh, well, compare it to uh, Stephen Batchelor's four tasks and show how it relates. Um, and so it has to do with um, being able to approach emotions with a kind of open, non-judgmental awareness that gives us a deeper feel for what's on board. And then being able to respond um, on that deeper sense of how things are going, on whether the emotions are helpful or unhelpful, and to be able to let go of the unhelpful emotions and orient to the helpful emotions. Um, and I'll be giving you an example from my own life to make it a little more uh, accessible, you know, give us uh, a richer ground to discuss it. Um, so, so emotion-focused mindfulness therapy, I've basically integrated clinical mindfulness approaches into an approach called emotion-focused therapy that views emotions as adaptive and has found a lot, of, um, a lot of different ways, researched a lot of different ways to help people when they get stuck around internal conflicts and unfinished business and, and trauma. And so then providing a way for people to integrate that into their practice. Um, this can be, um, emotion-focused mindfulness therapy can be uh, in an individual therapy, one-on-one -on -one, uh, with a therapist and client, or it can be delivered in groups, so groups of about eight people. And, uh, and they go for about 10 to 12 weeks, and there's a one-day retreat. Um, and the heart of it is uh, uh, meditating together, journaling the practice, recalling uh, whatever you recall about the practice. And then each person taking a turn, sharing their experience in the meditation and how they're feeling now, and the therapist empathically exploring that with them to help them deepen their experience, to help them uh, um, develop a more authentic experience with, uh, with if they're suffering on board. Um, 
and uh, if they're stuck to help them get unstuck and then be able to orient to cultivating their own growth and flourishing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it has, it has a lot in common with the secular Buddhism of Stephen Batchelor and Winston Higgins and Ramsey Margulis. Um, and so, uh, several things in common. One is emphasizing the primacy of experiencing that, uh, that we're practicing cultivating a deeper experience, a more authentic experience um, towards suffering, towards our existential situation, towards cultivating a more um, you know, deeply satisfying life, uh, meaningful life. And uh, a second one uh, would be uh, around, uh, I've gone and forgotten the second point. Maybe I'll come back to it. Uh, but the third point I wanted to make was um, that what we share in common is around viewing consciousness and, uh, and our sense of self and our experience as woven by multiple processes um, within ourselves and around us uh, that influence each other as they arise uh, so that our sense of self and experience is woven by, by these multiple streams and uh, and so that uh, oneself isn't some kind of little entity behind experience um, but rather it's being improvised continually in whatever situation we're in. Um, where, where uh, there's um, a difference um, has to do with uh, contemporary developments in, in psychology and neuroscience uh, related to emotion-focused approaches that view emotions as adaptive, as fundament, fundamentally helpful around uh, being, you know, being able to, if we tune into our bodily experience with non-judgmental awareness, if we, uh, and that helps us get a, um, a deeper sense of what's going on, a more authentic sense, and then being able to respond differentially to different kinds of emotions. Um, if they're unhelpful, knowing how to let go of them or transform them. If they're helpful, knowing how to, um, how to orient to them, to recognize and orient to them and make deeper sense of them and cultivate our life that way. So, um, yeah, so let me give you an example, uh, uh, an example of this. So it was about 11 years ago, and uh, I was getting dressed for my dad's funeral. And I was alone in a hotel room, and I don't wear a suit and tie very often. And I started worrying about, did the colors match? And, uh, um, and then it, the anxiety really started mounting. Um, and get getting kind of out of control. And so I paused, I tuned into my experience. And, uh, and, you know, it's like sort of in an open way, kind of, you know, like a like a swimmer in a current getting a feel for the current going with the worry going with the anxiety, and getting a deeper sense of it and beginning to realize it felt more secondary. I began to wonder if there was a deeper, th something deeper going on. So I tuned into my body more deeply, got the deeper chords of the feelings that were happening, and realized that, um, that I was grieving my dad, that I was really sad, really missed him, and, uh, and that this was the deeper truth about what I was experiencing. And in comparing and contrasting it with the worry about did the colors match, I could see it was the, the sadness and the grief that was the truth about what was happening. And the worry about the clothing then just blew off and I was able to orient to the grief. And, uh, and, and I, was, I was checking to see if the grief was a helpful emo emotion or not. And, uh, and I realized it was a helpful emotion. It made a lot of sense. It was very coherent. Um, and it empowered me then to go to my dad's funeral, to relate to my friends and family in a loving, kind way, and to give his eulogy. And so, so you know, there's an example of, of opening into experience in a non-judgmental way, getting a deeper feel for it, for all the different aspects that are happening. And, uh, and then based on that, starting to get a sense of uh, what's the deeper aspect of it? What's the more true? In emotion-focused therapy, we call that um, the, the pain compass. 
and uh, going for the more authentic feeling. And then, uh, and then based on that, letting go of the unhelpful emotion and tuning into the helpful emotion. And of course, grief, um, grief isn't always helpful. There's forms that are helpful, like the one I just described. Grief can be a key part of uh, helping us uh, make sense of loss and uh, know how to respond to it. But, uh, but you can also drop into forms of grief that are, you know, like being an orphan in a storm. My mom had died two years before, and you know, I could have dropped into an overwhelming grief that was much more threatening. Um, and then that calls for a different kind of responses. And um, just a sec. It calls for a different kind of response where we transform the emotion. And we could get into that in the question and answer period, if you like, um, about ways of doing that. So, so this, this uh, interaction then between an open, non-judgmental awareness, and then on the basis of that, starting to sort out, is it helpful or is it unhelpful? And responding to that uh, differentially. A lot, there's a lot of different forms of Buddhist meditation, and some of them, like Zen, emphasize the non-judgmental awareness, and other ones, like classic forms of Theravada Vipassana, emphasize um, getting a sense of whether a state and emotion is wholesome or unwholesome, skillful or unskillful, and letting go of the unskillful ones. So those are ones that are driven by um, by craving, eh? uh, by grasping, aversion, confusion, or, uh, you know, it's often referred to as greed, hatred, and delusion. And so letting go of those and recognizing states that are free of that and going with that. Um, so, uh, okay, so where are we going to go from here? Yeah, so what I'd like to think about now is to kind of ground that in Stephen Batchelor's four tasks and think about it from that perspective. So, you know, that's, uh, of course, Stephen Batchelor's take on the Four Noble Truths. And uh, just to back up for a moment, he writes about how, um, about how in traditional Buddhism, uh, there's the view that craving drives suffering. So that grasping, aversion, confusion drives suffering, not just in terms of unpleasant experience and pain, but also our whole existential condition of um, being born, aging, illness, dying, and then being re reborn again. And uh, that Stephen, on the basis of his reading of the early Pali Canon, very ancient Buddhist scriptures, um, he, he finds what's most salient, because a lot of contradictions in those scriptures, a lot of later interpolations, but what he found most salient in it is um, the Buddha talking about not what's traditionally known as the, the, um, the Four Noble Truths, but four tasks, and the, the tasks are um, embracing suffering, and developing a more authentic relationship with our existential situation, and then uh, recognizing um, when uh, emotions are reactive and interfering with, uh, with a more authentic uh, relationship with suffering and with what's really going on. And uh, so those are those emotions driven by, uh, by, grasp, by grasping, aversion, and confusion, by craving. And, uh, and then so letting go of those reactive emotions. And the third task then is appreciating and savoring uh, freedom, freedom from those kinds of unhelpful emotions. And, uh, and the fourth task uh, um, oriented to that, to that freedom, being able to have the freedom to cultivate um, our flourishing, our growth, and uh, I'm not sure Stephen Batchelor uses the word growth, but it's an important word in emotion-focused therapy. And, uh, you know, so cultivating uh, the Eightfold Path in Buddhism, uh, uh, acting uh, based on our ethics and our values. So if we think about that in terms of the example I just gave you, um, I realized I was suffering. I tried to orient to it in an authentic way. As I got a deeper sense of it, I realized that this worry and anxiety about the clothing was reactive 
unhelpful. And that, and uh, feeling deeper into the, my experience, I realized there was a deeper truth happening. And it was this grieving my dad, feeling so sad that he was gone. And, uh, and that that felt more authentic. And then um, the, uh, the unhelpful anxiety and worry blew off. I let it go. And I oriented to that, uh, to that more helpful emotion. And so what I'm wanting to highlight in the talk here is that that savoring freedom from um, emotional reactivity uh, driven by craving isn't just the absence of the craving, but it can also be this orienting to a helpful emotion that's helping us make deeper sense of our situation, what we're feeling. Um, it has a lot of implicit information about what we're going through and, uh, and that it's empowering and uh, helps us then um, act based on our values um, in helpful ways where we can cultivate our flourishing. And in this case, going to my dad's funeral and giving the eulogy and, and really experiencing my relationship, uh, relationships with my friends and family deepen as, uh, as a, you know, in the process of that. So, um, so then, so, you know, so I've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, how practice can involve opening with a kind of open awareness that's, when I say non-judgmental, we're dropping our preconceptions about the experience. Uh, we're not getting caught up in judging it immediately, but uh, developing a deeper sense of it, of what's happening in our body, coming alive to how our body is always resonating with whatever situations we're in and whatever we're thinking about and then reflecting on that experience in a way that helps us deepen um, an authentic, our authentic relationship with it. And based on that, so there's the kind of oceans of empathy in the practice of going along with whatever's happening. And then there's these, uh, these uh, kind of islands of work where we're beginning to realize, hang on a sec, this emotion isn't so helpful and being able to let go of it. And that a key part of that can be actually orienting to a more helpful emotion um, that actually orients to us, orients us to what's happening and empowers us to act in wholesome ways. And that that could involve um, reflecting on a situation the way I did um, in regards to my dad's funeral, or it could be simply thoughts are falling away and you're deepening into a, a wholesome calm, uh, that has an alive sense to it, perhaps, and uh, um, a, a pervasive kind of friendliness. Maybe you're noticing those qualities. So, um, so, so Ramsey suggested that I uh, come up with a question for you uh, to uh, to end the talk. And uh, so I was wondering, uh, you know, if uh, perhaps you might have examples that you feel comfortable sharing from your own practice to your own life, where you noticed an emotion was unhelpful, and you noticed a more helpful emotion, and you're able to let go of the unhelpful one and orient to the helpful emotion and and how empowering that may have felt and maybe i'll just give one more example uh ordinary example from my life uh, uh walking to work worrying and you know i had years of psychotherapy myself processing traumas and there was a point in my life where i where when i tried to drop below and see what was there i would expect really difficult emotions that i would have to process and then there came a point in my life where instead dropping down, I realized I'm feeling happy, which was really surprising given the worry about work or whatever it was that was seemed to be pervasive. And a lot of people don't trust happiness. You know, it comes and goes. Um, but learning to actually trust that deeper happiness, let go of the worry. It's just like the waves on top of the ocean and go with that deeper happiness. And then you can find yourself walking to work and you're enjoying the, the rain falling in the puddles and the sounds of the birds and, and uh, appreciating and savoring, uh, you know, how embedded we are in the world and our capacity, our deep capacity uh, to be able to trust our inner wisdom and uh, to navigate life. So, yeah, so wondering if you have any examples from your life of, noticing an unhelpful emotion, letting it go, and noticing a helpful one. Okay. 
I just unmuted our microphone. So that was, that was good. Anybody who wants to speak, I should just say go and put yourself in front of the screen or the, or the camera so you can set, Bill can see who you, you are. And uh, Ramsey, do we, do we want to record this part or we, do we want to turn the recording off? And that's totally up to anybody who wants to record it. Record it? Yeah. Oh, well, we have one okay. to report, two votes for record. Okay. Well, anybody who doesn't, doesn't want to speak, we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll not say anything. So <clears throat> we'll just edit it out. <laughs> oh, we can't. And we'll, your cut. I wish we could. <laughs> I'm not that skilled. I'll have, I'll have a go. Um, sorry. Right. Hey, well, my name's Alex. Sorry, I, I was slightly outside of the camera's view, but. Uh, nice to meet you. I, I was when I was sitting okay. Um and I'm also from Lower Hutt, so yeah. So, oh wow! Yeah. So anyway, oh, cool. uh, yeah, I suppose I had an experience like that on Monday, where I had uh, been practicing a game called Twilight Struggle, which is a board game. And practicing and practicing and practicing, because I was determined to beat a friend of mine. And uh, I've been practicing on on my phone, and I'd read all the whole strategy guide. I still managed to lose on Monday, and I was really, really annoyed really viscerally angry, particularly at myself, but also at, um, at, at fate. But I noticed those feelings come up and I saw them come up and I was like, ah, and I could feel them throughout my body, sort of like a physical sensation mm. in starting to let them go. And I suppose as well, just in terms of um, one thing, which I guess um, I'd seen from um, another sort of mindfulness, which is um, mindfulness integrated cognitive behavioral therapy, which is this, Australian Tasmanian guy, um, some, mm. some, yeah, but he'd had this interesting idea that sort of for um, in mindfulness practice that it can often be about finding physical sensations in your body, um, yeah, as leading to an indicator or a clue for emotion. And for me, I could just yes. feel it through my arms and through my chest, and yeah, anyway, I would say as well, I would, your, your talk really resonated with me, so thank you very much. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. So, so that when you can I just ask you a question then about that? When you uh, so you, you had the relief of the uh, of all that upset uh, releasing. I take it like you recognized it. You were able to let it go. And then, how did you feel at that point? I felt uh, very tired. Like I wanted to go to sleep. Tired. Eh? Yeah, but it was fantastic because it was also it was stopping me from going to sleep because I've been playing until like night. Oh, okay. At night, but, um. But it was so just, there's this relief, right? Eh? Yeah, absolutely. It was sort of it was seeing the reactivity in myself, and and mm -hmm. seeing trying to cover it up with other things, like I'd go and watch TV or look on my phone or something like that. Instead, I just uh -huh. just, sort of just face it and feel it and feel the feeling, yeah. and then to let it go, and you know to stop reacting and to be able to see my own thoughts and then let that go. Yeah, and so then you carried forward into a kind of exhausted, relieved sleepiness, right? That lets you uh, cultivate the Eightfold Noble Path by falling asleep, which was really, really appropriate. Yeah, it's a lovely example. Thank you. And I, I so appreciate you highlighting that point about how tuning into the body, and I think especially in a non judgmental way that lets the body speak to us, that it tunes us into our feelings. It helps us come alive to the feelings and navigate them better. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question mm -hmm. or an observation? Bill, I've got a question. My name's Duncan. Um, oh, hi, Duncan. How are you doing? So, in, in, the, in the example you gave um, at your father's funeral, um, what's sort of interesting to me in that is that you, you, you had this moment of, uh, uh, well, maybe, maybe not panic, but you know, stress, and mm -hmm. uh, and you're able to sense that that happening, um, and then sense into some of the underlying sensations and emotional context with that. But in, in that moment, that's a moment where your higher order cognitive functioning is shut down, right? So you didn't, you didn't, yeah. you didn't reason your way into that. No, no. Right? But you, yeah. there was still some habits 
of mind that yeah. steps you, maybe not automatically, but in that sort of really challenging moment, there were these habits that were powerfully enough established yeah. and to be able to walk yourself to that to that realization and that awareness and underlying stuff. Yes. I sort of wonder is is that some of the work that you do in practice where you just rehearse those habits over and over and over again as things come and go so that when these moments do arise it can happen sort of automatically well i think it's uh, that's a great question uh, I, I think it's fresher than that so it's something new and spontaneous is happening but you're right about it's uh it was based on a lot of experience and so that's that a faith that comes from trusting that we have this really uh, deep capacity to be able to tune into what's happening and make sense of it. And then something creative can emerge from that. It's actually fresh and isn't just based on prior conditioning. But, um, and I, I think that has, you know, uh, a contemporary uh, research in mindfulness, um, they're, they're coming up with three key components that help us do this um, and one is then so it's about being able to know that our thoughts and feelings aren't direct truths about ourselves or uh, others or the world and uh, how we can be so caught up in our head divorced from feelings or how we can be uh, just as you're saying kind of lost in a very unhelpful emotion um, and uh, caught up in old patterns that aren't helping us at all, but that we all have this possibility and be able to shift into our body and open with this non-judgmental awareness. And that creates some space around what's actually happening. Uh, so you can start to get a deeper feel for what's happening and approach difficult thoughts and emotions and old habits that are just repetitive in a fresh new way that disembeds us from um, from uh, those old habits and uh, and in doing so it lets us disidentify from them, it creates more space um, and it lowers the reactivity and then we've got a lot more traction for being able to uh, reflect on what's happening and develop a, um, a deeper sense of what's going on but what's what's different in, in what I'm uh, doing there and what I'm doing with clients is that we're not just emphasizing letting go of the unhelpful emotions and then orienting on the breath or whatever, but we're actually um, processing the stuck places so that they get free and uh, and helpful emotions so that we can make deeper sense of them when that's appropriate. And like I did with the funeral, for example. And then people, uh, then we discuss it in group and people can integrate that into their practice. And it's wonderful seeing people develop that deeper trust in their own capacity to make sense of things. And the, the key is being able to create a safe space where people feel they're being respected and um, the therapist is really interested, or the Buddhist teacher is really interested in their experience. Bill, does it feel like to you your and your people are uncovering a uh, a human capacity that we all have? Yes, yeah. It's it feels like we're herd animals. You know, like I remember when I was a younger adult camping uh, in uh, Central America on a, a savanna um, dry forest, and waking up in my hammock and feeling like I was in this golden liquid feeling and rolling over and looking out and I was in a herd of wild horses that were grazing around and I felt like I was in the in the the herd mind you know and I think this is uh Kevin Thompson's a Canadian uh, philosopher of consciousness and mindfulness that talks about how mindfulness is an embodied social practice and we all know as meditators how much easier it is to meditate with other people, you know, and so it unlocks this this capacity for us to go deeper and to make deeper sense of things. Mm -hmm. It's a human capacity. Yeah, this is such a different paradigm from learning some exotic uh, Eastern discipline, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. Uncovering yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, cool.
Thanks for that. Yeah, and then that sense the Dharma is how things work and your practice is finding out what works for you, uh, oriented to what matters to you and that your helpful emotions are revealing to you what matters to you in each situation. And yeah, yeah. And I think that's the heart of the four tasks a little bit. Even talks about. I don't. I don't know that he talks about helpful emotions. And, you know, I'm. I'm wondering maybe that's something fresh that people can consider. You know, and see, see how it sits with you. See if it helps you in your practice or not. And the, that's the key point, right? Does it help you in your practice in your life? And, yeah. Hi. Um. I'm Julia. First yeah. of all, thank you so much for that. That was really fascinating. Really good talk. Um. Just picking up on what Alex mentioned about cognitive behavioral therapy, when you were describing conventional Buddhism and sort of the process of recognizing and counteracting and letting go of reactive or unskillful thoughts, that reminded me quite a lot of the sort of techniques that I use in cognitive behavioral therapy. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how where emotional, emotionally focused therapy divides from cognitive behavioral therapy and particularly around the kind of techniques used with mindfulness. Okay, well, so, um, so uh, mindfulness as described in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy or mindfulness-based stress reduction, which it's based on, um, they, Create, it creates optimal conditions for making sense of emotions and being able to process emotions. Um, but interestingly, it doesn't actually specify and uh, encourage doing that. So it's basically, your, uh, it can happen, but the practice is basically one of undifferentiated, non-dual um, awareness, where if a difficult emotion, you're attending to current experience, you're letting go of thoughts about the past or the future. If a difficult emotion comes in, you approach it, um, you, make, you reflect on it a bit, and uh, you see that it's not a direct truth about self, other, or world, and you let it go, and then you return to something that's more oriented to the present moment. Um, I'm going to focus mindfulness therapy. We're orienting to a different kind of idea about the present moment. And the, the idea is the present moment is, uh, you know, it's about one to 10 seconds long. And then working memory um, chunks that together. So one to 10 seconds is like a musical phrase or a phrase in a sentence. And working memory chunks this together so that we can hear a melody or that you can follow the paragraph of what I'm saying. And that, that current moment's an unfolding wave or waves of emotion, and feeling, and thinking, and bodily experience. Um, and uh, it comes full of associations from the past, all this previous condition, condition which might be helpful or unhelpful, and emotions incline us towards the future. So in Buddhism, you know, this is called mental formation. So, so this whole body of conditioning, which could be more or less helpful, right? And uh, coming alive to our past conditioning and making sense of how we're inclined, we can let go of the unhelpful and orient to the helpful, you know? So, um, so that there's lots of room then, so there's a whole invitation in this form of meditation to think about the future, to feel free about reflecting on how you're feeling inclined. And that might be like going to the funeral and giving the eulogy and feeling empowered to do that, or reflecting on the past. Like, I mean, say I had dropped into a feeling like an orphan in a storm, um, and uh, over really overwhelmed. And uh, um, well, there, there's different ways of responding to feeling overwhelmed. You can bring something pleasant or neutral into the foreground of your awareness, focus on it and let everything else fall to the background. But another way that's been developed in emotion-focused therapy is the idea is you've fallen, in, you've dropped into, you've been triggered into a mode that we got conditioned into early in life. These emotions that are full, you know, that are really intense, that are overwhelming, that paralyze us and have this edge of helplessness about them, they're not information about the current situation. They're conditioned from the past. They're full of 
information um, in the past. And so it's like that young part of ourself is uh, living in the past and is organizing us and we fuse with it. So there's many ways of processing that out and it's part of what we do in these groups and then people can integrate that into meditation in their life. But uh, a really helpful one, uh, which you might consider, you know, any of you that, um, I think we all struggle with these kinds of emotions. They're the deep cords of our suffering and where we get stuck. If you could imagine a child in front of you that uh, that's feeling that way, not you, not you at a younger age, because that would trigger all the brutal ways we developed to get, survive our childhood, right? But another child um, that's suffering that way, a nephew or a niece or a friend's kid, and imagine that they're suffering that way. So that frees us from identifying with it and immobilizes our caring for other people. And you could imagine hugging that child and, um, and loving them and comforting them. And that can be really deeply comforting. So, so we're bringing in these different ways of uh, freeing ourselves from old conditioned emotions. And then that tends to free us to have more adaptive emotions. So that obviously goes way beyond anything you're going to find in the early Pali canon, right? But it's uh, integrating contemporary approaches to navigating human and feeling free to do so, you know, feeling free to do so. Yeah. Does that, does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. Does that sound wildly outrageous or like something that actually makes sense, what I was suggesting there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Anybody else got anything they want to either ask or contribute? So I'll just say one thing more thing about that technique. It's people have such a hard time often with self-compassion towards themselves. But imagining a child that's suffering moves our hearts. You know? And so then suddenly it's easier to relate to this part of ourself that's very young and is still living back. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, hi, Bill. I'm Peter. Um, I was just wondering how long typically do the uh, would a, a group be together for in terms of the, um, the, the the sort of therapy that you would do? Would it be like a year or two years, or would it be would it be a lot longer? As, you know. Uh huh. Well, I, I would love if it was a year or two years uh, in the weekly groups. But I work in a, in a downtown hospital that's, uh, that doesn't have unlimited resources. But, so, but, you know, uh, the mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy groups, those are eight weekly sessions, two to three hours. I've extended that to 10 to 12 because we're going into deeper processes. And uh, so they're 10 to 12 sessions weekly, two and a half hour sessions with a one day repeat. And then in all the programs that I do, so like I work with outpatients in psychiatry, I work with gay men living with HIV, um, I work uh, with employees in hospitals, I work uh, with mental health professionals. Um, so after that training is over, in all of these programs, there's continuation programs that people can, uh, can participate in. So with the hospital employees, those are weekly sessions at lunch, and uh, with, uh, with my uh, clients in psychiatry, um, those are monthly sessions. And uh, last night we had one of the monthly sessions and one person was saying, she's been participating in those uh, since I started doing outpatient psychiatry group for, for uh, since, uh, I think it's like five years now, five years. So it's a forms of community of practice. And this was one of my intentions in developing emotion focused mindfulness therapy was I thought it was time in in these clinical forms of mindfulness um, where we could um, previously people had to they would get this secular um, clinical training and then they were told go find Buddhist teachers and go on Buddhist retreats which is a wonderful idea but a big culture jump for a lot of people and uh, and so I thought I'd develop an approach that could provide a way for people to develop mature mindfulness practices 
fully integrated into the approach they've learned it in. And so these uh, continuation groups are very important to me and very uh, dear to my heart. Yeah, dear to my heart. And, and I, I think it's important for mature mindful people who have a, a lot of experience in mindfulness. Jack Angler's written a really interesting paper on this where he talks about how uh, the more deeper you go into mindfulness, the more important it is to be able to address the inner conflicts and unfinished business that we all um, that we all carry. And he did a study of advanced Buddhist practitioners and teachers in Asia and the West, and he didn't find one that was free of internal conflict. Right. So this is this is another part of our being human. Right. Um, that uh, that we have these struggles, and uh, hopefully our practice helps them helps with this. But it's also important to have ways to be able to access and uh, um, uh, work with these internal conflict and unfinished business, and provide contexts uh, where uh, meditators can go work on this. And that's part of my that's part of what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, hello, Bill. This is this is Ramsey here. Uh, I've, I've got Hi, an observation and a question. The observation is that um, Stephen Batchelor often teaches alongside Martine Batchelor, and they have very different styles. One of the things that Martine stresses is what she calls creative awareness in meditation. Wow. And I find I think that's a concept that fits well with what you're trying to do. Very um, much so. Very much so. And it's at the heart of emotion focused therapy that we have this freedom to be creative. Yeah. 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 And, and the other one was more of a question in that you described the retreat process that you take your groups on, and you say that you you as a uh, as a as the therapist, your role is to go help people go more deeply into their process and into what's happening for them and to look for uh, the creative, if you like, um, uh, a creative approach to them. Mm -hmm. It occurred to me that in a way, this is something that um, I've learned with Linda Madara. Ah. I was a teacher who was schooled by Jason Siff in his um, uh, recollective awareness meditation and yes. part of the process is also you when you're on retreat when you're working with people in group we don't have any groups in New Zealand but when Linda I was working with Linda and within we had online groups it would be a it would be a case of people going more deeply into their process and um, using the meditative process to explore that I just wonder if you had much thought or connection about either Jason's ideas or Linda's or anything yeah, well, uh, I uh, I did uh, train with Jason for years as a teacher, and uh, and I've practiced with Linda as well. I uh, attended retreats with them. Uh, I think when when I was training with Jason, his emphasis was more cognitive, and uh, uh, he did bring psychodynamic therapy in. Um, and uh, and what I introduced uh, to that practice network was this orientation to emotion. And, uh, and also uh, how to uh, engage with people empathically using the, um, the, these kinds of approaches where in contrast to psychodynamic therapy, the therapist is uh, saying um, both are attuned to clients, but um, emotion-focused therapists, uh, and there's a whole uh, group of humanistic therapies that underlie it. Um, they stay more actively engaged with clients. They'll, uh, they'll reflect what people are saying so people know that they're being listened to and they'll try to reflect in ways that help people get more in touch with their feelings and that uh, really help people make deeper sense. So there's this uh, continual process on um, uh, really getting a sense of what kind of emotional process people are in and helping them uh, deepen their engagement in that process. And whereas when I was training with uh, with Jason, the emphasis in the you know, what he would call a meditation interview is um, is on what happened in the meditation itself. And it's only when the person was feeling really overwhelmed that it would become more a focus on what's happening now. That that might also come in, but in uh, in uh, integrating it into emotion focused therapy. 
um, I also, well, I, I think the, one of the most important parts about listening to the whole person's narrative about their meditation is to get a sense of where are they now and being able to help them deepen um, their engagement with that and, and also to respect how they work with it. So, uh, so there's more of an emphasis on current experiencing and processing that. I, so uh, I, I, I'm not, it sounds like Linda's gone more into uh, this uh, emotion focused approach, which uh, I think is a really good idea. Yeah. Thank you. The, the other part, the, the other thing I'll say about it is um, the, uh, yeah, that, that there's all like a whole range of uh, approaches to help people deal with inner conflicts that then build on these ways of empathically engaging people that uh, kind of go beyond. Uh, I'm not, I gave a suggestion around imagining a child in front of you. But yeah, so I'm, I'm delighted to hear Linda's um, practices, um, taking that more emotion focused form, if I'm understanding what you're saying. Uh, thank, thank you, Bill. That was very useful. Uh, it's getting towards 5 a.m. in Toronto, so I'm sure you're probably ready to have a nap. Has anybody got any final comments or questions before we say goodnight from Wellington? By the way, we're in Wellington, not Auckland, so we're very close to Lower Hutt at the moment. You're, you're in Auckland, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, had a wonderful, I had a wonderful holiday in, in Russell uh, when I was a kid, and just it's one of my happy thoughts, you know, so... Auckland, such a wonderful city. Yeah. No, no, Bill, we're in, we are in Wellington. Oh, you're in Wellington? Yes. Oh, <laughs> why did I think you were in Auckland? I you are in Wellington. Here. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we think that's Yeah, because we take it in. That's, that's great. Well, that's such a lovely, uh, lovely thing. <laughs> well, look, uh, and what's the, go on. What's the name of the group in Wellington? One Mindful Breath. Oh, okay, you're not in Auckland. No, we're not in Auckland. We never have been. Okay, okay sorry about that. Yeah, here in Wellington, in the in, oh, in Wellington so. Friends, Friends Centre, which is we're hosted by the Crown. Oh. Wow. Well, so that's 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 even better. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. It's been a very very interesting fifty minutes. It's take, it's been a quite a lot longer than we usually have with a visiting speaker. So clearly that you've had you've had a lot to say. And we've had a lot to focus on, and that's been really really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, well, you're very welcome. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you here at some point in Wellington. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Right. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm just trying to find out how to this program. Okay. Okay. Uh, bye bye. Meeting. Exit full screen. <coughs> and